I have something to share with you. When power leads men towards arrogance, poetry reminds him of his limitations. When power narrows the areas of men's concerns, poetry reminds him of the richness and diversity of his existence. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses. For art establishes the basic human truth which must serve as the touchstone of our judgment. This is an extract of the last speech that President Kennedy made in 1964 before being assassinated. He was, he was honoring Robert Frost. Uh, and uh, in his speech, I think that it clarifies the role that art and creativity plays in social change. Art and creativity is not just something cute, but it's something relevant to build our collective future. Because there are some people, and today we're gonna to meet four, that work at the crossroad between culture, the arts, and social change. And these are the people, those faithful translators, that are able to forge new language, that are able to create spaces where criticality and imagination can happen, that are able to share the language that we need in order to build our collective future in a different way. Since the beginning of the forum, I think one of the key words that came out is this word of imagination. We need to reimagine democracy. We need to reimagine philanthropy. We need to reimagine ourselves. The interesting thing is that even though there is a strong understanding that creativity and imagination are really at the center of, uh, of, of our collective future, yet those organizations are grossly underfunded, the sector is completely overlooked, and yet there is still this idea, again, that art stays within a space of cuteness and not of relevance. Um, to fight this and to try to work around this, we created the Moleskine Foundation and we pursue a mission of creativity for social change and we dedicate our effort to support creativity pioneers around the world. And I think today we're going to have the chance to see what creativity for, for social change looked like in practice. And um, I'm very excited to have here today with me for incredible people. Omaid Sharifi from Afghanistan, co-founder and president of Arts Lords. Then we have Daniel Arzola. And I'm, I'm, we, the reason why we're laughing is because so far in all these days I use my strong Italian accents to call them. <laughs> that it sounds slightly different, so I'm trying to behave now. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Marta Atienza, sorry, Daniel Arzola, visual artist and artivist uh, from Venezuela. Marta Atienza from the Philippines, artist and founder of uh, Good Life Philippines. And then Hope Azeda, founder of uh, Ubumuntu Arts Festival in Rwanda. So we're going to start with Omeid. Uh, you're from Afghanistan, uh, a country that unfortunately is well known for the troubles in the past few decades. And most recently, in 2021, the resurgence of the Taliban at the power. And the question, the simple question that I have, that is not that simple, is how do you restore a sense of self in, in a country that has been decades under the siege of war? Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Adam. I will stand up. Uh, makes me feel good when I, when I talk. So thank you for coming here. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, today I want to talk about Art Lords. Uh, and, uh, I want to start with the name, why we decided with the Art Lords. Because we wanted to be the, the compassionate Lords, the positive Lords. Whenever you hear about Afghanistan, as Adama started, it's all about war. It's all about violence. You hear drug Lords. You hear war Lords. You hear corrupt Lords. At this time, we wanted to be the kind Lords, <laughs> the positive, constructive Lords. So, the fight was not only in the name, but actual fight against these warlords, these corrupt lords. 
because we started Art Lords exactly 10 years ago. And this is the time that there was, people were very hopeless. Um, uh, they were losing hope in the international community. They were losing hope in their politicians because they were so corrupt. And they were losing hope in a beautiful future for themselves and for their kids. And this is the time we said, okay, Art Lords is coming in. We will take responsibility. This is an Afghan-led Afghan initiative, and we are here to do something, do our part. In Farsi, in our own language, we have something that you have to take responsibility. So we try to find solutions in the heart of the problem. So that's how Art Lords came to being. And the, it came at a time that I felt there was a challenge that I had to solve. And that challenge was these big security walls that they were putting around the city, and these are called uh, blast walls. Imagine eight meters tall concrete walls surrounding the Said Business School, Oxford University. Everything that you see in the city is covered by, by these blast walls. And these blast walls were a symbol of oppression for me, a symbol of a divide between the rich and politicians and the ordinary people of Afghanistan. So what I did, not just me, but a good group of people and my friends who started Art Lords, and we started this tent that everybody could come in, we wanted to bring down the walls. We couldn't do it because these are security walls and people with the guns are standing on, on, on guarding them. So we started painting them. And the moment we started painting them, they disappeared. And that is the moment I thought, oh, this is an open canvas, you know? It's not just that we paint them, and this is an open canvas, why not we use it for issues which is very important, like issues of social change. And the first campaign we did was against corruption. It was famous, I see you. And there was a pair of eyes looking right at the presidential palace, <laughs> saying, I see you. I know you're corrupt. <laughs> if I cannot take you to justice today, but God is watching you, because Afghanistan is a Muslim country, God is watching you. And one day, we will take you to justice. So that's how we started it. Um, OK, let me see if this goes anywhere. Uh, yes. And the good thing is that we invited everybody to paint with us. So imagine one day in Kabul with my long hair, it was longer than this, and my friends who have long hairs as well, <laughs> we are standing and painting a wall. And then suddenly people come in and start speaking in English with me. They thought this is, maybe Americans are here to do some wall paintings for us. <laughs> And then I respond back by saying in Pashto and Farsi, saying, that, no, I have lived all my life in here. I, I have born, raised, educated in Afghanistan. Uh, and I, I'm here to paint. Uh, do you want to join me? I gave them a brush. Anybody from a kid who was like selling cookies and cigarettes on the streets, which I resonate with because I grew up like that, to the president of the country, they all joined in and painted murals with us. And these murals were against corruption, against violent extremism, against um, um, public health, education, women's rights, artistic freedom, all of that. So it is a movement of art for social change, run and sustained by artivists. Uh, we have some artivists here today. And it is a platform. The most important thing that happens is when you bring all these people together to paint this mural. This is the moment that I put seeds questions on their minds. This is the moment I asked them to question why, why your neighbor, which you knew him all your life, is suddenly so rich, he has a house in Dubai, in Istanbul. Where did he got the money? So simple questions, because in my part of the world, we are not taught critical thinking. So these murals were a way for me to encourage critical thinking. And also foster empowerment and responsibility, because the moment you gave them the ownership, the moment you give the communities that this is your own idea, what is your problem? Corruption? Yes. Let's talk about it. Let's create a mural about it. Ownership engagement was very important because they were taking responsibility and, and, um, and uh, the ownership of it. So that's how uh, we started and you can see anybody. If you wanted to have a message on the mural, welcome. <laughs> but what we did was we were sketching the murals one night before. So it's paint by numbers. Anybody come in, I gave them the brush. Okay, you can do the blue part. And then after five hours, they will have the, a beautiful mural. Uh, we used it for countering violent extremism because there's the crazy things happening in my part of the world where <laughs> religious extremism is very, very dangerous. So we would be 
creating content to counter the content which was developed by the Taliban. They were creating songs without music, promoting suicide attacks, and then we, were pro we would be con producing content which is about love, empathy, compassion, and kindness. We would be targeting that kid in that village that they were targeting. So that's how we use the, uh, some of the art. We did the street theater. These people have never been to a gallery. They have never seen a museum. They have never seen a theater show. So we would go to them. We would bring them to the play. And this is like in the border area of Afghanistan and Iran. And this is about illegal immigration. So this is how we went to all the corners of uh, the country. Our therapy, in my part of the world, <laughs> there's none. There's no help, you know, the only help available to treat your anxieties, traumas, and all of that is the painted meditation and art therapy sessions we were doing in schools, in universities, and all over the country. And what happened, 2021, Taliban came over. First thing they did, I always say, Taliban are very scared of women of Afghanistan and art. Any expression of art is banned. They destroyed 2,200 murals that I had painted. Two weeks in their, in their stay in Kabul. They wanted to kill me, my colleagues, and all of that, so forced me out of my country. But this is what they did. So the murals I had, for example, this is a mural which says we are the future of Afghanistan, and this is what had happened to it. Now it's their logo, their uh, made in Taliban. This is what I, uh, how I promoted women's rights in Afghanistan, and now this is the message Taliban has for the women instead of the murals that we had done. But this did not stop us. This is what is happening today in Kabul. They suppressed us, but we continue our work. Uh, this is the mentorship program for female artists I have in Kabul right now. And we went from Kabul to all over the world. So now <laughs> I paint, I come to your city, I come to your city, and I paint with you. We paint in the communities, I paint in Pakistan, in Istanbul, I paint in Middle East. Anywhere you are, next time I'll be in your city and we will be painting together. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> Martha, um, when we chat in these, in these days, um, you painted a, a picture that I tried to summarize very quickly. Um, you're from the Philippines, uh, from the coastal area, and uh, the Philippines is one of the most affected countries by climate change. And you worked with the fish folks from the coastal area that on one side are a key community for the food security of the country, at the same time, they are completely disenfranchised from the discourse around climate change internationally and nationally. And on top of that, there is a plot twist also that, that you added that there are also some forces in the Philippines that now paradoxically are using climate change as an excuse to move fish folks from the coastal area to the center because obviously this is still prime time real estate. And these are these communities that are not only disenfranchised, but they are at the center of a, of a crazy paradox. So the question is, how do you, how do you reconcile all this? How do, you, how do you go about bringing about change in, in such a complex context? Thank you, Adama. Um, I'm so nervous, by the way, and then my great presentation, and I actually have a text, but I'm gonna try to share um, how I work in the Philippines. Um, and I'm going to start with an image of the work I make together with my friends and neighbors. Let me remember how. Just wait. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I moved back to Bantayan in 2010, really thinking about how I, I as an artist could make myself useful. And so this question has always been reoccurring of thinking, how can art you know, tackle social, economic, and environmental issues. So the image that you see is Nungtunyo Turib, and this is a work we made together. He's standing on his boat, and I'm filming this together with kids that I taught how to film years ago, and they're now my crew. They're more, they're more technical than me, they're better than me. <laughs> Tonyo is going around his island where he was born and raised, and where today he's raising his own family. And I've been working with Nung Tonyo and his community for, for a few years now. Their island is really, really beautiful. And just like Adama said, um, they're facing many issues. I'm gonna talk about those issues again. Um, climate change, yes, the rising of the seas. Um, also rising of sea temperatures. Oh, sorry. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, you were oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and the rising with the sea temperatures, which is affecting their livelihood and their way of living. Um, but the other issue that the plot twist that you were talking about is that, you know, like this beautiful island, um, they want to turn it into a, a tourist destination. And so they're being slowly asked to move to housing projects. And, and this is a problem not just for Nung Tunyo and his community, but also in Bantayan, for coastal communities, but also the rest of the Philippines, and I know also neighboring countries, and this is happening everywhere in the world, no? Similar issues. The name of the series is Tigpanalipod, which means the protectors. And, you know, what we're really asking is who owns the land and who owns the sea? Because we really shouldn't be owning any of it, we should be protecting it. These are government and NGO housing projects where coastal communities are, have been moved to since Super Typhoon Haiyan, if you remember, in 2013. And, you know, we, we're facing extreme weather and uh, people are being moved for safety. But, you know, we also see a direct link between the moving of coastal communities far inland, um, just as because Bantayan is becoming a major <coughs> tourist destination. So, you know, a pub these are actually protected lands that are now becoming privatized because of commercial interests. And this is really destroying a way of living. Um, it's destroying a culture as well. So as talking to Danielle, this is my coconut tree um, methodology. <laughs> and um, after working in Bantayan since 2010, we formed an organization called Goodland as we've become more organized. You know, I've also I've realized that the process of making art together is a methodology to not only understand who we are, but as a way to identify and understand the issues we face together. It's really about a way of thinking and a way to dream about our future together. Not only about this, but we can put our dreams into action. I, I use the video camera, that's how I document time, but that's also how I create dialogues at home. But I've also taught my friends and neighbors how to use the camera themselves so that they can tell their own stories. Now this is, the documentation of ourselves is really the base of the tree. It's the archive that we are building together. The image you see is one of our youth. Uh, she's rehabilitating, she's working with her reefs. That's us filming Nong Tonyo. Um, these are inland uh, kids that have created their own workshops to educate other coastal area youth and sharing really their knowledge and building an archive together. This lady, she lives in the watershed and she's sharing her seed bank that actually goes back generations. Uh, this is uh, Lola Siting. She's still farming how her parents farmed and the kids are interviewing and filming her. Those are her neighbors. The images that are gathered make up an archive and allow us to see ourselves and the place through another perspective. There are sharing sessions, a lot of dialogues, uh, gatherings, and you know, that's, that's, a, that's how we create community. A community. Uh, we're creating a voice, a way of thinking that is inclusive and enables us to find our own solutions. And it's really dreaming about the future. We share knowledge and experiences, and this creates a support system and forms collaborations. Nang Naiding here, she shares to us that, you know, when she was younger, fish was abundant, and it was so cheap that when fishermen would come home, their baskets would be filled with fish, and they would put it on the beaches so that it could be shared with everyone. But today, there's so little fish, and prices are so high, that the fish goes straight to the market. With our archive, we're showing that our culture is alive and complex. And that's the cultural output. That's the evidence of that. And that can be a way for us to claim our rights to sea and land. And we were able to, to establish a marine protected area together with local government unit just because of a film of young people that they have made. It's also led us to platforms such as these, where we can create conversations and connect really beyond our own islands. And the dreams in action is where we make things happen. Most dreams are simply to live and 
live off and on our lands and sea to be healthy, happy, and together. And this image is an example of a rechargeable battery project that we did, that we worked on with fishermen and local engineers. We also have savings clubs where neighbors and friends basically put money in every week. And there they have a loan system. And there they buy food products at lower prices that they sell in their own group. And here they are busy collaborating uh, with university and local government, uh, working on their lands. Like they're here, they're busy uh, with the nursery for their watershed area. And I want to end with an image. Uh, this is the first Fisher Folks Day that we were able to establish in 2022. Fisher Folks Day is my tangible output that starts to define empowerment for me. It's a day that recognizes the importance of a marginalized part of our community. It's not just a celebration of that community, but it is an institutionalized avenue for them to be heard by the public, civil and private sectors. And it's because it's institutionalized and funded, it's repeated every year. So, you know, just like you were saying, you know, art is not just pretty pictures. It's a complex process of creativity, and I have chosen to make a functional and participatory process that values community, cultural knowledge, and giving everyone a venue to dream and express themselves. It's really a tool not only to express my own artistic uh, vision and values, but it creates a movement of local change makers. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Daniel, you were born in, in Venezuela, and uh, it's, um, Venezuela is not living like an easy moment. Um, there is an oppressive regime, military regime. You were describing it also as a moment where there is a new religious extremism. And on top of that, you mix it with organized criminality and local gangs. And you, you were telling me, and you grew up in one of the toughest neighborhoods, you know, in, uh, in Maracay. And, uh, um, you know, you, you grew up as a young queer artist. And this normally is the target of all that we said before. So the question for you is very simple. How do you survive? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm going to respond to that question saying that um, my art saved my life. My work changed my reality and not only saved my life, but also helped me to save the life of my family. Um, I'm an artivist. I do artivism. And I'm going to talk to you about that. To talk to you about my, about my, my work, I have to first talk about my story. Because as an artist, my work is the response to the things I live in to the society um, that I survive. Um, I believe artivism is not only about making social art. When art is not accessible, even if it's social, I think it's more institutional than social when it's not accessible. So for me, artivism is the emotive communication of a social message in an accessible format. Because art can influence culture and can serve as a symbol to recognize each other and to raise awareness. In this case, awareness about a reality on an idea. In other works, I, I think artivism is to intervene the dynamics that art used to communicate. Because art can transcend the life of the artist, but also can transcend the society where art created. <coughs> If we pay attention to the history of uh, art, we can understand also the history of humanity. Because uh, to me, art is like the world, the world of the spirits. We can have access to so many knowledge from people that existed before us. But you cannot imprison art because art is knowledge and art born from ideas. So I think art is this place where uh, ideas live and is essential for freedom because they cannot be imprisoned. Even if you fight against any of my artworks, they are going to, to survive beyond your life and, and even beyond mine. We can understand the reality, other realities, just through the power of a song, a movie, or an artwork. 
So I think that's the importance. But what happens when you cannot feel represented in your own culture? Your identity just changed. Uh, and, and that was uh, my case because I grew up in a place um, where I was set up for failure. And I think when you were, grew up um, being queer and openly queer in um, machista and male chauvinist societies, sometimes you have to, um, to resist until you have the power to fight back. And that was my case. I was, um, I grew up seeing my name written alongside homophobic slurs in my neighborhood. And I grew up trying to ignore that, but there is a point in life when ignoring violence is not enough, and sometimes you can face violence face to face. That happened to me when I was 15 years old, when a group of neighbors tied me to an electrical pole, and they bore me with cigarettes and fireworks. They destroy all my drawings during that time, and I realized that sometimes someone can destroy in a minute what took you months to create. And in that moment, not only my body was vulnerable, but also my art. But I, I stopped drawing for around six years, and I seek refuge in poetry that for me is drawing with words. But when you grow up, um, being queer in Venezuela, you just face another level of difficulty. If you pay attention to the history of Venezuela, you will, you will know that uh, we were facing, or at least in my case, I saw democracy crumbling slowly. When Chavez uh, took the power in Venezuela, um, I was um, around nine years old, so I grew up watching how people use democracy to dismantle democracy and now we are living in an authoritarian regime. But when you are queer, surviving to that um, add this extra layer of difficulty because um, you're not only surviving a dictatorship, you're also fighting for your own dignity and identity in a place where you cannot see yourself represented with res respect. Right now, Venezuela have the biggest forced migration in the world. Even when the official numbers talks about around 7.7 .7 million people, I can assure you that we are more than that, and that every year that number is increasing. Right now, we're even talking about 8 million of Venezuelans, and I just want one of them. Um, people leave their country walking. I, I say my, um, my work changed and saved my life because I have the chance to escape from Venezuela thanks because my work. Growing up in a society where I, w I wasn't able to feel identified or respected, it was very difficult. But it was thanks to the work of artists that I knew that my existence had uh, dignity and that I was someone that also deserved respect. Because if I learned something from artists and from art, it's like, like a big conflict. It's just the beginning of a great story. If you survive that conflict, you can find a way to tell a great story. And I think it's important to inspire others. Because when I was alone and I was set up in a homophobic um, environment, I found myself living on the streets when I was 15 years old. Because when you grow up being queer in a machista society, even your own family will, turn, uh, will put you away and will attack your identity day by day. It took me, and it was thanks to my work that I was able to um, heal my identity. When I was in art school in the last year, I decided to create illustrations that people could not destroy. And I, I have this idea to create a graphic campaign to talk about the reality of queer people in Venezuela. That's how I created No Soy Tu Chiste, or I'm Not a Joke. I'm Not a Joke are a series of 50 uh, illustrations that I mix between using digital illustration and poetry to tackle back homophobia and queerphobia in Venezuela. I posted this in social media and it became viral in 2013 and 2014. Just using Facebook, uh, Tumblr, uh, Twitter, my work uh, became uh, viral all around the world and made like this person living in a small town with, without cinemas, without museums, without galleries, to become a known artist. 
I think as artists also, we have the power to share our platform. And sharing that pl platform sometimes can uh, change the life of someone. Um, that happened to me uh, in 2014 when um, someone saw my work in the internet and decided to share it and say, this is not a joke, this is art, and that person was Madonna. That, thank you. Because, because when you have a platform, you can use it also to share the stories of others, and I think that's why, why artists are important. We can, um, we can change the world because we can tell not only the, the, the story of one person, we can share thousands of stories just through one creation. And I, think, I also believe in the cycle of inspiration because we can inspire, inspire people by artists, but then um, we get inspired by artists and then all artists can inspi inspire us. So I believe in the cycle of inspiration. Since then, I have, I have been creating um, artivism around, around the world. People cannot destroy my work anymore because it's digital, so the spirit of my work is indestructible. They try to do it every time. This is um, a permanent exhibition that I have in the subway in Buenos Aires. They try to vandalize this all the time, but we can replace this because my work is indestructible. It's artivism. My name is Anel Arzola. I'm an artivist. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Um, last week, actually, 7th of April, was the 30th anniversary of the genocide in Rwanda, or the starting of the genocide in Rwanda. Um, how, how do you restore a sense of community after so much pain? And, and how do you intervene in the generational trauma that affected your country, your community for so long. Yeah, thank you so very much. It's very hard to like say anything after all these people. <laughs> I don't know whether you feel the same, feel like a deep hole, and you're trying to speak from that space. And uh, that has been my life for the last, I don't know, 23 years I've lived in Rwanda as an artist. Uh, I have found that art is an encounter and so is life. Every minute of your life you come across this story and you have an encounter with this story, it throws you in this deep hole and you're looking for how do I come out of this? How do I be the light that, that, uh, that strikes this darkness? How do I be the light that you know, curves some peace to restore curves? How do I start? Where do I There's no specific way of restoring these things other than addressing the truth, which is very painful to face. But the pain comes with growth. So it's a process. It's a process from individual to individual. My name is Hope because I was born and raised as a refugee in Uganda. And a lot of children born around my time were given these things that refugees never had, like hope. My father named me Hope because I was hopeless. So you have friends who are peace, joy. I remember when we were children and we were playing, we were calling each other this thing. I was just playing for these, my friends yesterday. You are playing, you know, you're playing netball. Oh, peace, send me that ball, hope, oh, happiness, way, patience. <laughs> hey, faith, 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 oh, hope, you know? And we are playing. Hmm? But the whole environment is the opposite. Hmm? And that made me address the power of words. And that everything that comes out of your mouth shapes who you become. So if somebody, all they have to do is throw words of hate, words of pain at you. You don't let that take legal residence in your heart. So you have to like, you know, <laughs> deport that energy. Like, look at it as, 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 as a person. And I remember growing up, my mother built walls of love around us without even telling us we are refugees. Till you go to school and they tell you, when are you going back to your home? I'm like, which home? So you don't belong here? I'm like, you don't belong here? Then you go to your mother, and she's struggling to speak the truth. And that's what I'm seeing in Rwanda today, talking about addressing the truth. 
with the young generation that has nothing to do with our history, that has nothing to do with the Berigians or Germans that came and you know, created all these social classes till there was a genocide. But a, a generation that is being told to remember things they didn't see, but a generation that is experiencing emotional emotions that come with the past. But how do these emotions come to them? If you did not see anything bad in 1995, and you're born after, how come you get traumatized? And then I realized that the love and pain I have today has been passed on to me over generations. My mother passed love on me, to me because she was a selfless woman. And she constantly reminded us that we are here on earth to plant seeds of love, peace, and comfort. And that's my business. So I've grown up giving love even if I'm given hate. Then that was, the, but she's passed on now. She's 20, she passed on 2018. So I realized that the energy we pass on to the young around us has an effect on them. So in restoring them, but they also need to be told the truth. So how do you tell the truth? So this is the poem I've written in the voice of a mother. Uh, just to warn you that I lost my glasses in the bus that brought me, but I'll try to read. <laughs> how do I tell my children the truth? How do I take uh, their innocence, turn their eyes from the light they have known to the darkness I've seen? How? They ask and ask and ask, but how do I start? We argue and argue, but how do I begin? They don't see me, I don't see them. My truth is hidden in my pain. I want to tell them, but I have to protect them. And the only way through this is my story. So how do I start? How do I tell them that I'm still putting my pieces together? How? I am me, but I'm someone else. They ask and ask and ask. How do I tell them that I, can, I am someone else, but also I'm me? I am the child who grew up with no home, my childhood taken uh, for I was seeking a home. My home did not want me, my home did not claim me. Born with no birth date, my name a means to an end. But how will they understand? I can't hide the truth forever. Should I tell them that I have stared death in the eye, I have dodged it countless times only to learn that death Death is part of life. Death is a fact of life. From dust to dust, from crumbling soils, from falling leaves, from earth we are born and to earth we return. How do I tell them that this life is fleeing like a shooting star? How? So how do we address the truth? So the culture of truth telling is what, is what I'm really finding uh, eye-opening in, in, in just engaging with the young people born after the genocide. In 2019, I managed to call out an audition of about 200 young people born after genocide. Because in 2019, a generation was born, 25 years of age. And I was like, I want to hear what is in there. What is it? What are, what are the questions they're trying to address? And I, then I realized that their biggest problem, their one common problem was that they were not, never told the truth. They are told half truth. And they now, they now need to deal with the whole truth. One of the, one of the artists I met at that point was like, for, for all these 25 years I've lived, I was told I was a victim and that my dad died in Congo. But I just realized that actually my dad is on the run. So how do I, so who am I? Am I a child of a killer? How do you address that? Because for a long time we're addressing victims, but we also have perpetrator kids. And this is a generation that has nothing to do with the past, but we have to pass on the, the, the past to them. So what is it, what is it we're transmitting to them? So when we remember on the 7th of April, one million people that were killed in 1994 for 100 days, what is it we have to remember? So I'm going to play this short video just to show the, the uh, just a, a short click from the production we did called Generation 25.
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I refuse to be defined by that. Genocide is likely to occur again. And learning about it is the first step to understanding it. Understanding it is the first step to responding. Responding is essential to saving lives. Otherwise, never again will remain again. Thank you. Maybe we need a, a collective breathe. <sighs> um, th there will be so much to talk about, but unfortunately, we are under Kronos and on Kairos. It would be nice to be under the time of creativity and not the time, you know, that forced us to move to another topic. But I would like to ask you all, uh, the incredible experiences that, that you share with us, um, they are all somehow rooted in the local, into something very specific. And I'm wondering whether you see a connection between the local and the global. How the methodologies that you have implemented and used at the local level, even at the individual level, can inform the global context and can inform a higher and collective uh, framework. Look, I can tell that uh, genocide is not a random story. It's a global ideology. It's a global evil. Uh, when it happened with the Holocaust, 50 years later, it happened in Rwanda. And at that time, the world saw never again. But we saw it happen again in Rwanda. And signs are there. So there is a pathway to violence that we ignore. There are about 10 stages to violence. And I think number nine is, a, is dehumanization. So if you can detect and discern and read dehumanization in your community, it's not a Rwandan thing. It's everywhere. It's a global story. So like Generation 25 could be specific to Rwanda, but it's an open script to the world. Yeah. And, and also, um, the methodologies are local, yes. For example, we started painting with people. This is something we uh, started in Kabul, in Afghanistan. But then the issues are global. For example, we are facing the climate change. We are facing corruption. Corruption is everywhere in all parts of the world. And then how we can use this method, which is bringing people, communities together, to come up with their own message, with their own voice, and how we can all together paint this message. This could be replicated anywhere, in any community. Since the last 10 years, I've had requests from all over the world, people who have invited us, that they're facing some issues in their community, and they've asked us to, to come up and then create a concept with the community and paint with the community. So it is somehow we are on one corner, but we're all connected. And then these issues, as, as mentioned by Hope, so we can certainly use any of these methods and then and replicate it all over the world. I think in my, in my case, when I created um, the I'm Not A Joke campaign, No Soy Tu Chiste, I was uh, talking about the issues um, in my society. But when I got the response from people in other countries telling me, I want this in my language, I realized that we were facing um, the same issues in other, in other parts in the world. And, and I think it, I also learned that as an artist, it's important to portray these realities. Because even if we, if we share, if we have 
a thousand of different ideas and we, and we speak like so many, so many different languages, everybody feeling the same language. Everybody get excited about a movie or a piece of art in the same way. Um, so I think um, I realized that um, it was universal because art has no borders. I mean, just like Omar said, like we are, we're all dealing with same issues at the end of the day, actually. So, and the, the way that we are working locally is definitely something that that can be used in even just the word community. I mean, we have to create community. We have to create voices. Or, like what Omar said, like in a country where people are not used to be critical or to voice out, these methodologies are a way mm. to get that out. You know. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's something strange sometimes that happens when, when people deal with art. And, uh, and there is a, almost like a different part of their brain that connects, you know, um, and that we see it in the impact that your work can happen. But there is a dark side of it, uh, you know, and the dark side of it is that when we talk about too many funders, um, then they don't know how to, you know, necessarily fund the arts. And, uh, and there is this idea that uh, all of these experiences uh, often can be considered as exceptional. Exceptional not in the sense of uh, excellence, but exceptional in the sense of, well, it's, it's an outlier. You know, oh, Martha is an outlier. Hope is an outlier. Danielle is an outlier. Omaid is an outlier. So, so it's hard to, to, you know, to, to consider it as a, as, a, as a space and a sector to, to support. And I'm kind of wondering, you spent some time together in these four days you saw what each other do. Do you see some, some similarities in your approach? Is there, is there something that underpin your, your posture, the way you try to solve, to solve problems? Um, well, the, the underlying uh, uh, challenge we all face is nobody pays for art, uh, especially if you're an art organization. You're really struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been struggling for the last 10 years, and everyone here from Rwanda to Venezuela to Kabul, we are struggling. Uh, but at the same time, I think a lot of, uh, not only the donors, but the people, they really uh, do not see this approach as as, as critical it, as it is. Because look the example of art lords. I think what we did with, with, with art for the people who have experienced war for 50 years, so we had to create the visual alphabet for them to understand. And then they came up with their own indigenous solutions for the problems which were very big. So you give them a very simple tool with a brush and then invite them to, 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 to bring up their own solutions and engagement. Uh, I, I think I saw how much hope it brought to the lives of people. Uh, I saw their engagement and ownership uh, just with, with painting one mural in their community uh, it brought them um, uh, felt them that they're part of this 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 uh, this country and they can have a voice. They can amplify their voices. I remember when we were painting and the kids who were on the street selling cigarettes and stuff. They would bring their family members, showing that this is the part I I painted, and then uh, and and they were protected. Like in Afghanistan, when we were painting for ten years, only three murals were defaced from two thousand two hundred murals in a country that you imagine anybody could do anything with your art but the community was protecting these murals. So it's so important for the communities when they have that ownership. Uh, and then at the same time, as we were facing a lot of challenges to buy a brush, a bucket of paint and all of that. So I think for, for all of our friends here, we are all in this school tent right now uh, and we all have noble intentions and we are all doing good actions to follow that. It's so important that we all connect our islands uh, and, and those islands, once it's connected, it can be, make a bigger wave of change, positive change, uh, which we all have to do at this crazy times in the world. So uh, if, if you, in your programming, you have money, your foundations, you're supporting civil society and the good work, consider art as, 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 as an important and essential uh, solution, not a, something cute or beautiful as Abdama was saying. It really is changing attitudes and behaviors. It really changes opinions. And my friend, one of uh, our friends here, he meant, you remember the Renaissance in Europe, it really changed Europe. And I think that Renaissance, if we need it today, will come through art, and especially public art. 
It's a... <laughs> Every time a conversation comes about money and art, I don't even have a language anymore. Because <laughs> I was born in a, in a family of 11 kids, uh, 10 scientists, and I'm the only artist. <laughs> and, and to always constantly prove to my father that this thing is good. <laughs> it was a big war, and I still face that same thing. Because my dad asked me, so how much bread is this going thing to go? But like, Dad, this art is not just about a loaf of bread. <laughs> it is me it's a medicine you find in a pharmacy. You not, it's not the medicine you find in a pharmacy, although my mother had a pharmacy. But it is that medicine for soul and spirit. It's about behavior. How, you can't touch behavior change. You can't touch soul. It's, it, it exists in different dimensions that many funders cannot, because funders want numbers, one thing. But like, sometimes I don't know how to count. <laughs> how do I count change? <laughs> Yeah. How do I count change? Yeah, how, yeah. Ma how many kilograms is change? <laughs> you know, for me, it's, there's that bit of uh, abstract something that it exists in a different dimension, yet it really operates on, in, on, in, in our lives. Yeah. yeah. So that's my challenge. How many loaves of bread is one song? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah, yeah something that I, I found in common uh, talking with the, the, my colleagues, my, my friends now, um, is that we, um, we believe in art as a tool to, create, to build uh, memory. And I think it's important to, to create memory and to represent the realities that we are facing. Because we, are, we, we need to communicate to the people from the future the things we're living now, only paying attention to history we can avoid to repeat um, the same mistakes. And I think um, I found that uh, same sense of uh, using our uh, work to, uh, to build memory. Uh, the storytelling aspect of art, I think, is also um, meaningful. Thank you. I don't know what to add to that. <laughs> but you know, like, remembering is an act of resistance by itself already. And that's something that doing these years of work of people creating their own stories and when you get young people to remember that that is the resistance and that's so powerful but yeah it's true how do you measure that and how do you explain that even in words mm -hmm. I mean even that's why I have such a hard time stand here and, and and speak you know because how how do you say in words what you're doing that's why i came up with the coconut diagram you know <laughs> but you know like how how do you how do you make it clear to other people or how do you, the importance you know yeah you're doing just fine mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. i think with that we we can open up for for questions. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, here it starts. Thank you guys. That's there. We got there. Go ahead, Tessa. Um, thank you all so much. I think for so many of us in this room, this session has been really nurturing and healing. And that's what art does. Um, yeah, I can say art changed my life as well. It's made me more politically aware, more connected to each other, um, you know, builds empathy, all these things. And all these things you're talking about too that aren't measurable and being at school <laughs> is an interesting experience um, coming from the arts. When we're talking about social change, social impact, these things that we cannot measure, I'm so curious as to what your experience has been at school, talking about your work and seeing how people respond um, and, and what you feel maybe art could shift at school and programs like, you know, forums like this that are about changing the world and systems change, but art is still relegated in some ways to the side. So I'd like to hear about that. Thanks. Anyone? Do you want to take a question? We, want, you take more, we take two questions and then two, three questions and then we go, okay. Kumi, you got it here? So Adama, thank you so much. <laughs> so I just want to say a big thank you to Adama for pulling together this amazing panel. My only regret is this panel should have been on a plenary at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to say that uh, I've been an activist since 15. I was the head of Greenpeace, Amnesty International and so on. And I've realized the biggest mistake I made because my son two years ago told me 
you're really bad at your job. <laughs> and he said, because everything you've been working on from the age of 15, uh, everything's getting worse. Gender equity, democracy, human rights, and so on. And I asked him, so why do you think I'm so bad at the job? Uh, because I agreed with him. And I'd already arrived at it. And then he said, the problem with you all in mainstream activism is that you'll aim all your narratives at the brain. Mm -hmm. So facts, figures, science, policies, and so on. And you'll completely ignore the art. Mm -hmm. And if you look uh, hard with the hitch in it, <laughs> uh, and, and, and if you look today at who's being successful in the world, it's the Donald Trumps and the Bolsonaros mm -hmm. and the Modis of the world who completely ignore the brain and go straight for the art. And then I said, you're asking me to lie. And he said, like these guys do. He said, no, you don't have to lie, but you can be much more creative about reaching people with the facts. So I just want to say that in September this year, uh, a range of organizations are coming together in South Africa to organize an inaugural global artivism conference to try to unite this field. We, we want it to be Global South-led, and I'd like to invite everybody here to participate, and I just want to thank everybody in the panel. Thank you. Take another question, right, right there, right there. Thank you, thank you very much. Congratulations, and thank you for the panel. I just want to make a reflection and a question about measurement the impact, because I work for an organization we promote local art in conflict zones with victims for memory, for healing, for truth-seeking. I want to challenge the idea that this is not measurable. I, I, I think it is, and I want to ask you, because you explain it uh, very well, uh, Omid, about the impact on the community. So I think we failed if we measured thinking on quantity <laughs> and numbers instead of quality. There are ways of collecting people's reactions, people's opinions, people's change of behaviors. And I think that, I think it's difficult for artists when you become social changers, and then you have to institutionalize your art <laughs> to create some mechanisms to collect that information and to create you know, perceptions, surveys, testimonies that really show the impact that you guys have. I think numbers or virality, respectfully, is not that important. It's more like the, how you change the people's mind, not how many minds you change. And I think there's opportunities there that we need to find the money <laughs> for you to have the support in order to co you do the art, but you collect that information that can give more funding. It's how we're trying to do it just to collect the money, so. Maybe is there some initial reaction to these three questions that we move yes. on? Yeah. 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 If, I can, if I can go, go ahead, um, well, being here, this is my first time in the UK, so responding to how, um, what this meaning for me. It was powerful because as a Venezuelan person, it's very difficult to get a visa, like the borders are being closed to Venezuelans around the world. And Skull helped me to get a visa in five days, which was mission impossible to someone with, with an uh, expired passport and without access uh, to a passport because uh, the dictatorship in Venezuela used passports to control people. So in the last five years, I have no access to a new passport and Skull helped me to get, get here. Hello. So I... <laughs> and another thing I want to say is that I believe in artivism because as you were saying, I think uh, activism needs the activist to be there, needs the word, needs the reason. But artivism is about the emotion and there is knowledge in the emotion. And the art, the, my art will be here when I'm not here anymore and will transcend. So I think it's important to use that power. Um, go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to talk about my experience being at school, this beautiful family of amazing people doing amazing things. I think one of, uh, there's a, I had a very interesting experience in the dawn and doers session. I found myself on the middle line there, and I just ended up getting a seat in the middle line because I found myself I am a donor sometimes because I'm giving all my all. That's not in terms of money, but in terms of me, myself, and my experience, and my talent, and how I'm just sharing everything. I'm sharing me all the time. We are putting ourselves there 150%, and you can't put a price tag on that. So I'm a donor that, but I'm also on the doer. So I was like, wow. So I'm, I'm both. So I felt like I was also a donor, and I was also a doer, and I felt just nice. <laughs> <laughs>
I, uh, the experience at school, this is my first time at school. Um, we all go to many conferences, all of us. Um, and then most of the time I feel that I am there to do a job, be a, have a loudspeaker, speak about my work, speak about artist address, speak about artistic freedom and all of that. But what I feel at school is that I feel people are present. I feel they are very genuine, they care. Every person I've met, They've hugged me, they've embraced me, they've, they've hurt me. Mm -hmm. And I think a school is for me. Everywhere else, I was going to raise awareness about my work. But this here, it's for me. As a person who is, all of you are at the front line of this work. And it, it takes a toll on you. It's very tough work. And you're alone there. I am alone there because a lot of things come to me. I have to take care of it as an activist, as an artist. Uh, and it becomes lonely, it becomes difficult. And I think at school, it is somehow healing, as you mentioned. There is solidarity, there is empathy, although there could be more. But I think still, this is by far uh, a great experience. And I, I, I said it the other night, uh, I think it's something else. It's, there's an energy that I don't understand it, but it's good. It's really good. Uh, and Kumi, you have <coughs> inspired the generation of activists. And, 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 and we, a lot of us have followed uh, your path. And I'm so, so grateful that you're doing the Artivism Conference. And hopefully, this room and a lot of us will be there. Uh, to, and then I think there's a school tent, and then there will be an Artivism tent that all of us can <laughs> come, come together. <laughs> uh, and on the impact, uh, yes, we, we, we can measure the impact of this work. Look, I, I did the ICU mural, which was one of the first murals. And one of the murals had, was at the presidential palace. And, on the other side of the road is the Ministry of Finance. And then there's an image of me pointing my finger at the room that the Minister of Finance was sitting. So Minister of Finance, which he was no longer there, he was telling me he had blocked the whole window of the Ministry of Finance. Because every time he was looking up, there was an uh, image of me like pointing, I know you're corrupt. You can Google it, so it's all in Google and all of that. <laughs> Uh, so this image is like, like I, I know you're corrupt. Uh, and then there's another one. Uh, <laughs> the vice president told me when he was no longer the vice president, he said every time he was crossing the mural ICU, he would think with himself, name of the hundred people he would meet, that this, this is corrupt, this is corrupt, this is corrupt. And then he ordered the mural to be erased during the Republic. And then there was a huge outcry. It went viral. And then they paid me back to paint the same mural at the same time. <laughs> so, People have told me that when they're sitting on their uh, uh, dinner time, they speak about this. I mentioned about, like, ask your neighbor where did they find the money to get all of this armored car and, and, and became millionaires in, in a night. People were speaking about all of this. The heart, like, I think we touched those hearts. We encouraged people to ask questions. And that's impact for me. That's change for me. So uh, I think, and there's more if we can find some ways to really measure it and, and methodologies that would be for our donors to, to, to see those numbers. We're running out of time. We have a couple of questions we can do quickly, and uh, we can do it there. Either three, but very quickly, then we can, we can try to go. Hello. Um, I think we've spoken a lot um, today about you know, um, how art isn't being adequately financed, and artists aren't being supported. Um, but we're also at a time when the very definition of art is being redefined um, with technology. So my question is around the livelihood of you know, being an artist. It's, const it's currently being threatened by things like AI, where now people have the tools to create art pieces with, work with just a few words. And similarly, there are, like, these tools are also in the hands of people who, who are trying to create a negative kind of change. Right, and we're banking on the goodwill of these technologies and these platforms to put the guardrails on these technologies on like what kinds of arts that people can create with these tools with just a few prompts. And when you know art isn't being bought because it's still we're still struggling to get people to see art as a commodity. Um, and artists aren't being supported because people see your work and they go, Oh, that's cute, that's very, you know, oh wow. But then <laughs> their wallets stay in their pockets, right? <laughs> um, and then there's these technologies that are coming to you know, threaten your very job. 
How do you deal with that? I'm curious to know. Okay, quick, quick, quick question. The question you could try quick. I don't know if you're going to be able to answer them all, but you know, question can make us think. No, this, the, I'm going to be very quick. This is more a reflection. Uh, I think uh, uh, trying to uh, contribute to, to your question of what's common in, in the four of them. I think I see that the process uh, that, that you have created to, to create change, I think that's what, what it's common on you. Like the process, and because for you, the end product is not important. It's the process that you go through. Yeah. Uh, so, and we're, we're an organization that we fund art for social change, and we fund art for, for behavior change, so we put our money where uh, our mouth is. So. I think, and we, I invite all, all other donors in the, in the room to do the same because, and we don't see this as a nice to have, we see this as a, an, a key part of, of the success of a project. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And I work in intergenerational and collective trauma. And one of the things that I see that um, is so valuable that you're bringing is being able to address these very challenging things in a way that is safe. Because, you know, turning towards trauma can be re-traumatizing. And art with the beauty, with the engagement, really provides a safe space for that. And the other thing that I feel is really important that you guys have a very important role to play in is how can we as humans reown perpetratorship as a wound? And to be able to look at that part that has you know, so much shame and so much, so much guilt requires that there is a certain distance and that there is a, a context for that. And I see that you know, in what you were asking, am I the child of a killer? Like being able to look at that part and you know each one of us own our little piece of perpetratorship it obviously might not be that i killed somebody but i might have dehumanized someone else like how do we actually reown that in a way that empowers us i think you guys have something so powerful to contribute thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you thank you yeah quickly go ahead <coughs> see if we can Um, thanks again for everything that you're doing. Um, I run an organization called Super Being Labs, and one of the parts is Super Being Arts. And we were talking about uh, recreating the Renaissance. Um, one of the projects we're working on right now is an experiment called Stop Thinking, Start Feeling. And it's actually using art. Our experiment is could we get Trump to start feeling? Mm. So it's how can we use art to get the worst people in the world to start being children again? And I'd love, I, I understand there's no time for an answer, but let's talk about it later or tonight, is have you got a time where you've made someone who doesn't feel, feel? Because I'd love to learn from you and I'd love to collaborate with you on this. Um, because I think there's only a finite number of bad people in the world and if we can reach them, reach their hearts, big changes can happen and we don't need funders. A few maybe, but little. <laughs> Thank you. I think we need to, because we're almost there, a few reactions, and then we go for the closing. On the, on the issue of technology working in the space of humanity, because art is humanity, I think humanity is, um, art is still needed to keep the balance between robots and humans. You know, so like in our festival around, because our festival is in arts and humanity, we have created spaces or days that we have called art meeting technology and bringing stories of home to life. And this is where including like coding schools, like guys, where is your life and where is your art? And it's really just nice to see artists and scientists having okay. a conversation and creating things because we need to keep that humanity element in us, otherwise we become robots. So art is still needed in its authenticity um, existence, I think. Yeah, and I think also about feeling comes first because art needs to be that tool or that vehicle that curates spaces of empathy. If you don't feel my story, then I will not feel your story. If you don't come to the life that your pain, my pain today can be your pain tomorrow. We need to come to that understanding mm. that humans are humans. You know, even if you put a knife on, on Trump's neck right now, the 
pain he will feel is the same pain I will feel on my neck. Yeah. yeah. So we need to realize that mm -hmm. you know art is there as a key to also opening spaces of empathy. Um, unfortunately, Kronos is upon us. Um, so we're arriving at the end of it. I feel, on one side, I'm a little bit, um, I have a, have a lot of emotions, but I, I won't lie, part of this emotion is frustration and anger because it's not a case that I started with a quote of JFK in 1964. And we're still thinking about, oh, art is this new thing of doing things. It's a new way of like, trying to solve problems. It's been there forever. And we keep hiding ourselves against this fate of efficiency. And we keep hiding ourselves because, be, behind the research of a KPI. You know? But now we do live in the era of creativity. And it's really time to be courageous and act the shift that is need to be happening in order to really recognize these incredible people, not as outliers, not as one off, not as a nice to have, but as a new group of change makers. Creativity pioneers, creativity, creative change makers is a new cluster, is an old new cluster in which we need to invest so we can really go about changing the world in a new and different way. Engineers is where they try to save the world. They didn't make it. Maybe it's time that we start investing in creativity. And the question of being courageous, it's important. And it's important in its etymological terms. Courageous, being courageous, it means to act the heart. We start to, to really act the heart. And if we do that, I really do believe that we have a chance to build a new collective future for all. So thank you, everybody.